stillness I know that you are God in the secret your presence I know there I am restored when you call I won't refuse each new no one else for me, no none but Jesus, crucified to set me free, now I live to bring him praise, in the chaos and confusion I know. You're sovereign still In the moment of my weakness You give me grace to do your will When you call I won't delay This my song through all Crucified to set me free, now I live to bring him It's always our heart to learn more about you, Lord. And Father, we are like children before you. And Father, children are ones of humbleness and brokenness, Lord God. They are ones who are moldable, Lord. And how we want you to mold us more, 
how we want you to have your complete work in us, Lord God. So we pray that by the Holy Spirit, God, that, Father, you'd be the potter in us the clay, Lord God. We ask God in Jesus' name, like we've been praying all week, that, Lord, every heart would be changed, every heart would be touched, every heart would be ministered to by you and by your word, God. And, Lord, we soften our hearts to you, Lord. We yield them to you and we say, have your way, Lord God. Now, Lord, teach us like only you can. In Jesus' precious name we pray, Father. Amen. Please be seated. We are in the book of Joshua 24. If you have your Bibles, it would be Joshua chapter 24 tonight. This is the last chapter of the book of Joshua. We'll finish the book, and next week we'll start the book of Judges. We ask that you read ahead. On Sunday morning, we are in Revelations chapter 2. Probably go through verses 1 through 8, something like that, 1 through 5. I think the first church of Ephesus, that's probably what we'll touch on. We won't touch on, we'll do an in-depth study on the church of Ephesus. So please read ahead. It's a lot easier when you go in and you're taught when you've uh, read ahead. Joshua is 110 years old. He's instructing his people concerning God. He warns them. He encourages them. He reminds them of God's awesome power. But Joshua is more or less on his deathbed. He's getting ready to, his life is almost completely ended. His ministry's over. He's going to go and be with Moses, his friend, in the bosom of Abraham. And I'm sure he's looking forward after 110 years. After being in the service of the Lord, we know, uh, as much as we know concerning Joshua, his whole life he served God. And I have no doubt, as you look back on his life, 110 years, he has no problem in the sense of, I was faithful to God as much as God helped me to be. So, this is where Joshua is, and he's going to tell the people he's going to warn them he's going to encourage them he's going to remind them of the past things that God has done remember he's on his deathbed you know and I've kind of kind of thought this and in the sense of if the Lord does tarry which I don't believe he will I keep on looking to different things in the sense of the scripture that we see happening right before our eyes so I really believe with all my heart that we are going to be tasting the rapture real soon but if he doesn't, I believe that what needs to be done is we need to look back in our own personal lives and just, not in a condemning way in any way, but in a way of making sure that my life is one that I can look back in my life and I can say, I was faithful to God, not because of me, but because of me allowing God to be faithful in me. You know, there are certain things I believe that we need to prepare for. Because we never know when our life is going to end. Yes, we know Joshua here is 110. He has a full life and his life ends. But there are certain things I believe we need to do just to prepare. There are certain things that I have done that I've written my sons. And I've told them certain things. I've written, sent them letters and I've said, you know, I'm proud of you. And, you know... I, I tell them all different kinds of things. And there's another thing I believe God's been telling me to do. To write certain things just in case something happens. Who knows? So my kids will know. My wife would know. Or whoever. My friends in the church. Or, you know, church family. I want them to know how I feel in the sense of if anything does happen. And I personally believe that every single one of us as we get older should do that. You know, what if you're gone completely? You go out, you get hit by a car, and God takes you home. And it's, it's a plan by God. What are you going to tell your children? What are you going to leave for your children? Yes, you're going to leave a lot of good things. I agree. But wouldn't you want to have something that said, you know what, son? You know what, honey? I love you. You're the, you were the, you were why. And I tell this to my wife on a regular basis. But you made life so much better and so much easier and so much fuller. And God gave you to me, and I, I'm thankful to God for that. But I'm just saying, it's good to write certain things down 
to leave them in a paper or leave them in a letter or leave them on the computer, whatever you want to do, just to share concerning people that you love. Joshua has the blessing of knowing that he, God's going to take him home. And he's able to tell all these people these things. So, this is where we are in Joshua 24. Let's start in verse 1. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem. <clears throat> and he called for the elders of Israel, for their heads, for the judges, and for the officers, and they presented themselves before God. So, again, they take them to this place called Shechem. Shechem is a place of worship where they offer, offer sacrifices. This is a place that for many years where the main place is like Jerusalem is today as they just celebrated 70 years of Jerusalem and the United States taking their embassy to Jerusalem and them celebrating this this is where, what Sessim was Sessim was their main place where the worship was where everything was the main capital so to say of the, of the land of Israel so to say and it was put in a certain place, a perfect place. If you go to Setsum today, it's like an amphitheater in the mountains where you can just get out and speak and everyone can hear you. Now, Joshua probably has about, because he has everyone there, all the children, all the adults, all the men, all the leaders. So he probably has maybe three million people there. No one can stay home. You know, I'm going to watch TV. There's no TV. I know that. But no one gets to stay home or make excuses. We can't come tonight because I've got a headache. Or he, Joshua said, every single person that breathes, that are Israelite, you come. Because there are things that I want to say to you that there's no excuse. Well, I didn't know it. Nobody told me. No, Joshua, by God's Spirit, is going to tell these people. And let me tell you, if somebody was passed away, Pastor Chuck passed away. If he would have said, you know what, I want all my pastors to come down and meet with me, I would have went down, no matter what. Because I, want, I would want to hear what, he, what God would have to say through him. And more or less, that's exactly what's happening. These are Joshua's last words to God's people. Now he goes on, and Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor dwelt on the other side of the river in old times and they served other gods. So we want to look at this in the sense of yes, Joshua is speaking. But now God is taking over and God is prophesying. The word prophesy literally means to bring forth really God's word. And God has spoken to Joshua and Joshua is speaking exactly what God has said to him. And he begins to bring in somewhat their history. Begins to bring in these people, Terah, who is the father of Abraham, Nahor, the brother of Abraham, and then Abraham. And he makes this statement. They used to serve other gods. In other words, Abraham literally was an idol worshiper. He used to serve gods of the Mesopotamia area. That's where he grew up. Until he was 75 years old, he worshipped false gods. And we know now he serves a totally different God. Now, if you became a Christian, at what age? It doesn't matter what age you became a Christian. Some people became Christians at young age. I think Dan was probably one of the youngest Christians. Dan, when did you, what, how old were you when you became a Christian? Eight years old. I was 27. So my point is, is this. I served false gods for 27 years. Dan didn't, I don't know if Dan served any false gods. Okay, but I know for sure I did. <laughs> what I mean by false gods, anything we serve that is a god to us, in that place of God, we serve false gods. Now, it can be pleasures that can become false gods. It can be drugs that can be false gods. It can be sex pornography, it can be any other thing. Power, money, all those things. If we didn't know God, we served other gods. That's how it works. Okay? Anything that's first, that's our God. And so we serve false gods too. And now, 
The Bible says we are to serve the true and the living God. We'll talk about that more as we go on. Now he goes on, verse 3 and 4, Then I took your father, Abraham, from the other side of the river, led him through all the land of Canaan, and he multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. To Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. To Esau I gave the mountains of Seir and to possess. But Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. Now, I want you to notice the progression, notice the progression that God says that I am the one who started this whole thing. I am the one who chose Abraham. And he says, I took Abraham on the other side of the river and led him through the land of Canaan. Now, Abraham did not choose God. God chose Abraham. I'm going to say that again. Abraham did not choose God. God chose Abraham. Abraham was in idolatry, serving false gods. And God came on the scene and said, Abraham, he talked to him. And he says, come away with me. And he told him what he was supposed to do. And then when Abraham did obey, which took a few years, God began to lead him in all the land of Canaan. Now, I say with that with this in mind, that God desires to lead us. This word lead means to bring away, to carry, to cause to walk, or take to some place. Now, it is God's, in God's heart that he took Abraham right where he needed to go every single time in the land of Canaan. Now, we know that Abraham made a mistake, a few mistakes, because he became fearful. But we also know that God led him and God wanted to lead him in the path of his life. Listen to what, and we're going to be in this in, in the book of Revelations. It says seven times, and the Spirit says this to the churches. The Holy Spirit literally in those seven churches in the book of Revelations, chapter 2 and 3, will literally be speaking to God's people, trying to lead them either into a place of where he wants them to be or a place away from where he doesn't want them to be. God is in the business of leading us. So how does God lead us? Well, I just felt this feeling. Now, Pentecostals, and I'm not against Pentecostals, so don't get me wrong, but they believe that if you feel led this way, that God is really leading you. And let me tell you, I have felt led to do certain things, and I wish I've never had done them because it wasn't God, okay? We at Calvary Chapel believe that we are led by God, yes, by the Spirit of God, through the Word of God. We are founded on this. Your feelings are going to deceive you. And if you go by your feelings and your thoughts, you're going to be in trouble. Imagine if you acted on the way you thought today, on certain things you thought. You'd all be in trouble. We would all be in trouble. It is God's heart. He desires to lead us. And let me tell you, it's really simple. You can relax and let God lead you. God will speak to your heart and bring to remembrance the word of God. The thing is, here's the key, and please listen. As you give lordship over to Christ, Christ will take over lordship. There's the key. If I don't give him lordship, then I'm going to be in control. God will only lead us as much as we will yield to his leading. You know, we say, Lord Jesus Christ. And we think it's his whole name, and it's not. Lord is his position of our hearts. Is he really the Lord? You know, Peter had a problem. Lord, no, it not, that shall not happen. And literally, he, what he, the Lord had told him that he was going to be dying, he was going to crucify and raise. No, that's not going to happen, Lord. It's a contradiction. And so, God wants to lead us, but again, we have to 
yield and surrender ourselves over. And the more we surrender ourselves over to God, the more God will yield us, will, will, will lead us. Notice what it says here. And I will multiply his descendants, and I gave him Isaac. The greatest gift that God gave, I, gave Abraham physically was his son, Isaac. I'm not talking about spiritual. Imagine this. You're in your 90s and you've never had a son. You've been blessed by God. You have wealth. You have servants. You have everything except for you don't have a son. And then you go to God and you speak to God and you say to God, I have everything, God, but my servant's going to inherit all my money, inherit everything I have. I don't have a, 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 someone to hand this down to, a descendant. And God speaks to him and he says this to him. Abraham, you have nothing to worry about. Not one thing. I'm going to give you a son. I'm going to give you a descendant. And through that son, you're going to be blessed like the sands of the sea. He's going to be multiplied. And imagine you're 90 years old. You're probably thinking, yep, yeah, okay. I believe you, God. I don't know. I, be I believe you. I don't no, I don't believe you. Yeah, be this week I believe you, God. No, I don't. Tomorrow. All I'm saying is, I'm sure that Abraham had some questions. Because we see that in a short period of time, he gets swayed by his wife. And we know, know for sure exactly the motive. But we know he should have, he probably doubted. And this is why he had some relationship with his handmaid. And Ishmael came out. But God gave him a blessing of having a son. Now, that is nothing to say anything against daughters. That's not what, this is not the issue. The issue is he needed a son. And God says, I gave him to you, Abraham. This child that you had, it just didn't happen. You had a relationship with your wife and all of a sudden your wife's pregnant, here comes the son. God says, no, I specifically gave you Isaac. This is the boy that is to be a man and this is the one that my descendants are gonna come from too. And when I look at children, the Bible says that children are a gift from God. Every child is a gift of God. And how we raise them can be, stay a gift or it can be a torture, horrible experience or a painful experience. It is important that we recognize children as a gift from God. My sons, God gave me those sons and I know that without a doubt. Your children, God gave you those children. No ifs, ands, and buts. And he knew who you needed. He knew how he was going to be or she was going to be. Sons or daughters, whoever may they, they may be. He knew. And so we are to look at our children as gifts from God and precious. Now, listen to what he says in these, verse 4. To Esau I gave the mountains of Seir to possess, but to Jacob and his children, went, he went down to Egypt. So, two sons, twins. Esau, he says, I gave this mountaintop up here. God had promised that he would bless all his descendants. And yes, Esau was a wild man, the Bible teaches. But God blessed him with land, and he had the land of Edomites, and he had many descendants. God blessed him. But to Jacob, it was a whole different ball game. Jacob would go down to Egypt, talking about Israel, the nation of Israel, would go to Egypt and they would go into, into slavery. First of all, they would go to be protected by God. Famine was happening. People were starving to death. And God took all his people down to Egypt to take care of them. But God had told Abraham also that they would be in bondage for a period of time and they were now why did God do that why does God allow one person to go to his land not that everything worked perfect for Esau but he had his own land he didn't go through the same thing that Jacob went through Jacob is the favored son the blessings of God are upon Jacob I have found it to be true. The more the blessings of God have on your life, the more times that God's going to allow certain things to happen in your life to keep you on the right track, to keep you in his perfect plan. God took him down to Egypt, I believe, to prepare him to go into the promised land. 
I'm talking about this nation. Now, he goes on in verse 5. Also I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to what I did among them. Afterward, I brought you out. Then I brought, I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. So they cried out to the Lord, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, brought the sea upon them, and covered them. And your eyes saw what I did in Egypt. Then you dwelt in the wilderness a long time. And I brought you into the land of the Amorites, who dwelt on the other side of the Jordan, and they fought with you. But I gave them into your hands, that you might possess their land. And I destroyed them before you. And Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose to make war against Israel. And he sent and he called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam. Therefore he continued to bless you. So I delivered you out of his hand. Then you went over to the Jordan, you came to Jericho. And the men of Jericho fought against you. Also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Gergesites, and the Hevites, and the Jebusites. But I delivered them into your hand. I sent the hornets before you, in which you drove them out from before you. Also the two kings of the Amorites, but not with your sword or with your bow. I have given you a land from which you did not labor, and cities which you did not build. And you dwelt in them, and you eat of the vineyard and olive groves which you did not plant. So what is God doing here? God is speaking to his people. He has 3, 000, 3 million people here, and he's talking to them and telling them everything that he did. Not everything, but the majority of it. God is trying to bring them back to the history. Now, history, we could put capital H and put a hyphen between H-I-S and Adon S. His story this is God's story concerning the people of Israel. Have you noticed how forgetful we are concerning the great things that God has done? I want you to go back in your own... If you've been... If you've, many of us have been Christians for quite a while. Go back into your own life and look and see when you first became a Christian the first year, the first two years, and look and see what God did, the miraculous thing He did, because I'm sure that you don't remember. Maybe your marriage has fallen apart. Maybe your world has fallen apart. Maybe, I don't know, only you do. But God decided to intervene and to do wonderful things. Now let's look back six months ago and see what God did. And don't tell me that God didn't do anything. If God didn't do anything, then there's something wrong with the clay, not the potter. Because God is constantly always doing something in us. God is either drawing you closer to him and speaking to your heart and working in your heart. God is some way or another changing your heart, doing something miraculous. And sometimes those miraculous things are painful, painful, painful things that go, we have to go through in our lives. Let's look at a couple of things that he tells them. He says this, and, I, and you saw with your eyes what I did in Egypt. So God is speaking to them and he's saying this to them. When I allowed those plagues and you were over in Goshen and you were sitting there and you saw the darkness cover, you saw the locusts come, you saw fire come down and burn. You saw all of these miraculous things that I did. When I was, and you were at the sea, you saw the chariots coming. You saw me open up the Red Sea, and you went through it. You saw a pillar of fire by day and a pillar of fire by night. A cloud, I'm sorry, by day. A pillar of fire by night. You saw all these things. You, I witnessed all these things. How many have ever seen God do something supernatural? I mean, amazing thing like, I can't believe that happened. I've seen God do those things too. 
You are an eyewitness to God doing great things. I think the greatest thing, and I'm not putting down any miraculous thing, but I believe the greatest thing that God can do is change a heart. When God opens the mind of a man or the mind of a woman concerning this kind of a sin, he says, I'm going to free you. And he frees them, and they're different. To me, that's a miracle. And I've seen God do that to a lot of people. But I've also seen people who God has set free go back into the same bondage. And that's a sad, sad situation. Then it's twice as hard, not for God, but for that person that walks away from it, that freedom, to be freed. Listen to what he says in these verses. Then you dwelt in the wilderness a long time, and I brought you into the land of the Amorites who dwelt on the side of the Jordan, and they fought with you. I want to remind you something. This is what God says here. That it wasn't you who really won. And he says literally, he and God, they and God fought together. In other words, in the battle, they had to do their part and God did his part. God supplied everything that was needed. The Bible teaches that we are in a spiritual battle. And, and let me say this tonight. We are probably in the greatest spiritual battle than we've ever been in. And I'm not saying that if you're not feeling this battle or just tugging or just fighting going on, or you're, I'm not saying that at all. That's not what I'm saying. But Christianity is being attacked more, at least in America, than ever before. What a lot of Christians don't realize is in the 20th century there's been more people killed for their Christian belief than all the rest of these centuries together and it's increasing more and more. You don't see it on the news but there are a multitude of Christians being killed. And I believe that's spiritual more than anything else. You and I are in a spiritual battle and yes, we are more than conquerors to Christ. God has equipped us and given us the armor of God and we need to put those armor on every day because we're in a battle. And God will go with this and we'll be successful. But there's still a battle. You're going to win, but there's still a battle. You still have to fight. So God speaks to them and tells them, I fought with you. Then I delivered in them into your hands. I sent hornets before you who drove them out before you. Also, two kings of the Amorites, but not with your sword, are with your bow. So he speaks about these hornets and that they're really, what he's talking about is fear and panic. That God sent fear and panic before them. You remember the story of when they went into the land and they went in to take the city of Jericho and Rahab said, we've heard about you. And there it said, all the mighty men, their hearts are all melted. They're scared to death. They've heard of your God parting the Red Sea. They knew every, every story. But God had sent before these stories and these thoughts and put them in the minds of, my, of men. And t literally, they became fearful. When you go and you fight in a battle, and that person who you're fighting against or the army you're fighting against is fearful, the victory is more or less already won. All you have to do is go and claim it more or less. And this is exactly what God was doing concerning his people. Now he goes on in verse 14. Now therefore, because of all that I've done, God says, because I fought for you and all these things you've seen with your own eyes, now therefore, fear the Lord. Serve him with sincerity and truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt serve the Lord. So he tells them, first of all, to, serve, to fear the Lord. To have a reverence for God. I believe that the fear of God is literally is not wanting or letting anything get between you and God and your relationship with God. A person who truly fears God will do this. I'm not taking any chances. I'm not doing anything. And I'm not trying to legally be a legalistic in any way. That's not what I'm saying at all. So please don't misunderstand me. 
When you're in love with somebody, when they're your life, your thought is, this is so good and so wonderful that I don't want to cause anything to get between me and this person. And this is what part of the fear is, is and that proof of that fear will, that person will hate evil, will hate sin, will hate things that will separate. Now listen to what Proverbs 14, 27, thinking about the fear of the Lord says, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. Listen to what Proverbs 14, 26 says, in the fear of the Lord there is strong confidence and his children will have a place of refuge. So, the first thing he says, we are to fear God. And the second thing he says, is serve him with sincerity and truth. The words, and we're going to talk about this a little bit Sunday, I'm not going to really go into any depth today concerning this, but the word serve literally means to, to labor, to do a, a work for God, but in truth. And what God says is truth. Alan Redpath describes it as this. The best test of sincerity is not always the open hostility of foes, for this often braces up the energies of the combat. While at the same time, it makes the path of duty clear. Still less is it at the hour of triumph over our foes, then there is no temptation to rebel. The real test of our faithfulness to God is in most cases is our power to continue steadfastly in one course of conduct when the excitement of conflict is removed and the enemy with which we have to contend are the insidious allurements, our ease, our customs amid the commonplace of the duties of life. So it says serve here in sincerity, complete, whole, entire. In other words, when you serve God, put your heart in it. That doesn't mean that your feelings are automatically going to follow everything. It's going to always be there. You're always, let me tell you, there are times that, and I don't care what ministry you're in, I don't care what you're doing concerning God, there are times you're going to feel like it and times you're not going to. You know, the, Paul tells Timothy to preach the gospel in season and out of season. Teach the word of God in season and out of season. What he's saying is, is this. There are going to be times that you're going to be gung-ho and you're going to be teaching the word of God and you're going to say, yes, yes, yeah, let's... And there's going to be times like, I don't want to get in the pulpit today. I don't want to say these things that I need to say. It's too hard. The people don't like me no more. I remember hearing a story about a, a man, he's, his mother, he's like 30 years old, and his mother comes to him and he says, son, come on, we've got to, we've got to get up. It's time to go to church. He goes, I don't want to go to church. He said, son, he said, son, you, we, you have to get up. Come on, it's time to go. To no, the people don't like me there. He says, their mother says to him, come on, son, you got to get up. Why do I have to go to church? You're the pastor. My point is, there are times that you feel, you don't feel like it. You don't in your heart. But you don't go on your feelings. You go on faith in the word of God. But God wants you to put your heart into it. Let me tell you how I feel. And I think I've shared, I've shared it with Dan. I've, my wife knows this. Every time I come to God's house, I expect something from God and I expect God to do something in the hearts of you. Every single time. It isn't because of me. It is because the Word of God and God's true to the Word of God. God says the Word of God is what will change a heart. The Word of God is what gives us wisdom and counsels it, it encourages it strengthens it, it corrects it does everything it's supposed to do all you have to do is prepare your heart that's all you have to do accept the word of God and God will do the work so God went wants them to serve him with sincerity with wholeness entire completeness in other words put your whole heart in what you're doing no matter what it is it doesn't mean you know, I thought about this today. It doesn't mean that I have to be doing everything in the church. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what God's saying at all. God has gifted certain people and every single person should use their gifts with their whole heart in it to do what God has called them to do. That way the whole body functions. That's how it works. 
Did you know I need my kidneys? They're in the back over here. And it, when you, you get a kidney punch, oh my gosh, that hurts so bad. My point is, you can't see my kidney, but I need my kidneys. If I don't have my kidneys, I'm going to die. I need my bladder. You don't see that. I need my heart. You don't see that. But every single part is so important, and every single part of me is working right. And it's working right in you. That's why you can stand up, you can walk, you can talk, you can think most of the time. <laughs> now, he says also to serve him with truth. It literally means reliability, our reliableness, surety, faithfulness, continuance. So God wants them to serve him. Whether they're in season or out of season, God wants them to serve him, whether they feel like it or not. Joshua was 110 years old and he served God. 100. At least we know for sure. 80 or 90 years. We don't know as a kid growing up. But he must have. He must have learned from his parents because he, he always stayed with God in everything. Now, put aside all the gods of your fathers that your father served. Now, how many were, got, became Christians when you were older? Raise your hand. Adults. Became Christians, me too. So, were you, how many parents were not Christians when you were being raised? Raise your hand. Me too. So let me tell you what they taught you. Not on purpose. They taught you how to serve false gods. Not on purpose. Okay. And so, what God says now, He says to us as Christians, put aside the gods that your fathers served. My father loved TV. My father loved violence in the sense of not in the sense of, you know, hurting somebody bad or anything like that, but he was a violent man. Uh, he was an alcoholic. He was a womanizer. How do you do with 14 kids? But he was. And I'm not saying anything bad. My father's in heaven now. God forgave him and cleansed him. But my father had a horrible temper. He was a fighter. Um, I mean, you name it, he, he was... Now, a lot of things. But my point is, is this. When you recognize that you were taught those things, because you have to, when you're an 18 year old with another man, in terms of growing up and everything else and seeing them, you take on some of the traits, that's the God that he, the gods he served. And you know what? I took on some of those traits. And now as a Christian, I don't have those traits because God has said, put away those gods. And it's the same thing with you and me as Christians. We need to put away those gods, if we've served, our parents served those gods, we need to put them away. And they should be not part of our life anymore. Now, verse 15, and we're getting done. And it seems, as it se and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river are the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So three, three thoughts we want to touch on the, this verse 15. They're going to have to choose. It's a choice to serve God. And they will have to choose that day of who they're going to serve. Now it's true, there's a saying that says everyone serves someone. Everyone serves someone. Today you are serving some God. Hopefully it's Jehovah. Most of you are, I'm sure. But if you're not serving Jehovah, you're serving some God. And let me tell you probably the biggest one that you have the possibility of serving is yourself. I know you think, well, no, no, no. Yes, we all have that. Now, the second statement, it seems, if it seems evil to serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to serve the Lord. I want to read this word to you. It's not like evil, horrible things. In the Hebrew, if it seems injurious or if it seems that it's going to harm you, or if it seems like it's displeasing, I don't want, 
<laughs> so in other words, if you feel like it's displeasing, you know, to serve the Lord, then, okay, that's up to you. And you see, there's a lot of people that misunderstand concerning serving God. They think, if I'm a Christian, I'm serving God. If I read my Bible, I'm serving God. If I'm praying, I'm serving God. No, you're not. Let me tell you why I read my Bible. I want to learn about the God I love. God wants to work in my heart. I want to know whatever he wants me to know. That has nothing to do in the sense of serving God. Okay, praying. Well, I'm serving God by praying. No. You're praying because God tells you to pray. You're having that relationship and that intimacy with God, heart to heart. And also you're entrusting God and you're asking God for wisdom. Counsel me, God. Show me. Okay, so all those things are for my benefit. But serving God literally means I'm doing what God has called me to do concerning my life, whatever that may be. I tell young people, I tell my grandchildren, hey, you pray. Ask God what he wants you to be. Because God has a plan for your life. Maybe he wants you to be a doctor. Maybe he wants to be a dentist. Maybe he wants you to be, I don't know, an electrician. Maybe God wants you to be a carpenter. God wants you to be, I don't know what it is, but God has a plan for your specific life. And that's what you need to follow. Don't follow the money. Don't follow the fame. Don't follow any of those things. Follow what God wants for your life. And then in that calling that God has on your life, and I say calling, God has something for you to do in the body of Christ. To serve him. And then serve him with all your heart. But if it seems evil, if it seems displeasing to you, well, you know, I don't even think I should serve God. You know, I got other things. I serve God my own way. You're right. You serve God in your own way, not God's way. And, and I thank God. And please listen. We have so many Christians in our body that serve God with their hearts. I'm, I'm amazed. Dale really serves God. Chuck and... I mean, there's so many of you that really do serve God. So it's a blessing to be able to see that as a pastor. Now I want you to look at this third part. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua understands that he is the priest of the family. Was charged with the responsibility to see that his whole house served the Lord. He had the job of representing his house, his whole house, before God. When my children were young, they're grown up now. They, I believe my older son teaches Sunday school sometimes, or he was. They take his children to church and they send them on missionary things. But in my home, when growing up, my children grew up, they knew they had to do something for God on a regular basis. They read their Bibles, we prayed together as a family, we served God together as a family. And you know what? We were all going to serve the Lord. In my home, I told them, when you leave my home, you have been taught, but it's up to you what you do. But while you're in my home, we're going to all serve the Lord. We're not going to serve the world. We're not going to serve any of those things. And it was a hard thing at times because they wanted to go do this. And I said, no, you can't do that. In fact, my two youngest ones left home because they couldn't go out and do what they wanted to concerning the world. They couldn't date girls. They couldn't, you know, go out to some parties. And I said, no, that's not happening in my home. And that'll never happen. And the Bible teaches that we are to stand, especially us as men. And it's not the women. I'm not saying that they shouldn't stand too. But the total responsibility comes to the man. That's me. That's you, men. That's how it's supposed to be. I want to share another same thought, same idea. And this is Elijah speaking to all the people of Israel. He says this, 1 Kings 18. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel. And he gathered all the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and he said, If God is God, then follow him. Serve him. But if Baal, follow him. I serve him. But the people answered him not a word. And I read that because it coincides. It's the same thought. As you know, that story goes on. And Elijah calls fire down from heaven. 
And all of a sudden, they all get fired up after that. Now, verse 16, So the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is he who brought us out of the, out, and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the ways we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out from before us all the people, including the Amorites who dwelt in the land. We also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. So the people make a strong covenant in response concerning God and they commit, to commit themselves to God. In verse 19, but Joshua said to the people, you cannot serve the Lord for you, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after he has done you good. If you look at Israel's history, and we will be looking through it as we go through the book of Judges, we will be seeing that these people for the one generation, for all those older men in that generation, every one of them, they served the Lord that whole time. But after that generation died, they began to drift away from God. And every man began to do one thing. And you know what it was? Same thing in America and the world is doing today. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. He says here, you cannot serve the Lord for he is a holy God. Joshua is not trying to discourage their faith, but he's trying to discourage a light commitment to follow the Lord. They needed to be reminded that they are serving God under a covenant that promised they would be cursed for disobedience. Jesus expresses the same kind of warning that followed following him was a total commitment. I want to read to you. Now listen, as a Christian, this is in Luke chapter 14, 25 through 33. Now great multitudes went with him. And he turned and he said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, his mother, his wife, his children, his brothers, his sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. But which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he had enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it began to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether, consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks the condition of peace. So likewise, whoever you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. So what is Jesus saying? He's saying this. Run the race and finish the race. Be committed your whole entire life until the last breath, just like Joshua. When Joshua said it's over, it's over. He went to be with the Lord and that's, we should do the same thing, no different. That doesn't mean we can't do less. Don't misunderstand me. As we get older, we will be doing less. But it's the heart that God looks at. And he finishes, and the Lord said to Joshua, no, but we will serve... I'm sorry, and the people said to, the, to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. A good response. So Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourself that you chose the Lord for yourself to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. Now therefore, he said, put away the foreign gods which are among you and incline your heart to the Lord God of Israel. And the people said to jo Joshua, the Lord our God we will serve and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made for them a statue, statue and an ordinance to set them. Beloved, sometimes people, or God's people, make promises that they can't keep. But this is not one of those times. This generation actually kept the word of God and they served the Lord. Verse 26, and we'll finish out on these next verses and we're done then Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God. And he took a large stone and set it up there under the yoke that was in the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, the stone shall be witness to us, for it is heard all the words of the Lord which he spoke to us. It shall therefore be a witness to you, lest you deny your God. So Joshua let the people depart, each 
to his own inheritance. So he's dispersing them after talking to with all these people that go to their land. And they, some of them go from hundreds of miles. Now it came to pass after these things that Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. And they buried him within the borders of his inheritance at Timnath Sirah, which is in the mountains of Ephraim, on the north side of the Mount Geisha, Geish. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had known all the works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. And then the bones of Joseph which the children of Israel had brought up out of Egypt, they buried at Sechem in the plot of ground which Jacob had bought for the sons of Hammer, the father of Sechem, for 100 pieces of silver, which he had become an inheritance of the children of Joseph. And Eliezer, son of Aaron, died. They buried him in, in him they buried him in a hill belonging to Phinehas, his son, which he had given to him in the mountains of Ephraim. So all these great men, Eliezer was a great spiritual man. He dies, all these men die. And like I say, one generation, then we'll go into the book of Judges and see how these people act. Okay, we're going to stop there. Any questions on tonight's study? Yes, Jim? Yes. Any other questions? Yes, uh huh. Let's see. When Joshua died, I think about 20, it's been about 60, between 60 and 70 years. Nun, N-U-N. He had no father. He's the father of none. <laughs> that was for them to be a witness. Uh, every time they looked at that stone, they may, that would look at that stone and say, here's the covenant that you made with God. Ebenezer Stone, yeah. Well, God worked in all their hearts. You know, when you're in bondage, when you're in slavery, you learn a lot of things. That's what they say most of our Christian growth comes from when hard times happen in our lives. Because we're willing to submit and surrender because we don't have any choice. So... God prepared them, I believe, to go in there. And, but evidently they weren't prepared enough, at least one generation, because of faith. So, okay, any other questions? Okay, let's stand and let's go to the Lord in prayer. We're glad you're here tonight. Father, we are grateful for the word of God, Lord. We are thankful for the Holy Spirit, Lord God. And we thank you we, we serve a God that knows our heart and loves us and works in us and changes us, Lord God. And Father, it is true. You call us to serve you. You call us to fear you. And we want to fear you, Lord. We want to serve you, Lord. And sometimes, Father, we need to recommit ourselves, Lord God. Reestablish that deep relationship with you. Come back to where we need to come back to you, Lord God. So if that's needed in our hearts today, Lord, we recommit ourselves to you, God. You're our first love. You are why we live and what we, why we breathe. And we thank you, God, for all the wonderful things you've done in our lives, Lord God. We can look back just like Israel did and see how many wonderful things you've done, Lord. How you provide it, Lord God. For our children, Lord God. And how you've blessed our children. How you've given us homes and, and so many things, Lord God. And we thank you, Lord God. We are grateful. But Lord, we want to expect from you spiritual things, Lord God. Blessings of love and joy and peace and all those things that your spirit desires to bestow upon us. You tell us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a commandment. Because you want to fill us, Lord God. So Father, may all that you desire for us as your children, may we receive them, Lord God, by faith in the word of God. And Lord, I thank you for those who are served so, Father, commit it to you, Lord. Bless them in all they do, Lord. Provide for them, Lord. 
And Father, continually anoint them like only you can, Lord God. And then, Lord, help us all to do whatever we do as unto you with our whole hearts, Lord God. Father, with sincerity of heart and truth, Lord God. Now continue to guide us, Lord, and lead us, Lord, through our days and through our weeks and our months and our years, God. In Jesus' precious name we pray, Father. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful night. I'll be up here if you need prayer.